Good morning and welcome to Phoenix Fellowship at Worship. Today is the first day of 10, at least, where our temperatures are 80 degrees or less for the next 10 days. I keep saying this. I said it last week. I think this is the best time of year in Phoenix and this area. If you're not here, you should be. It's a wonderful place to be. And I want to greet those of us who are afar, uh, our extended family all over the world, in various places of the world, in the United States, wherever you are, please know that you are welcome and we want you to be blessed by the service today and pray that God's Spirit will be binding our hearts together, even through the distance that separates us. Our scripture this morning comes from Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, and I'm reading verses 13 and 14. And this will be one of the pieces of our study for today. Daniel 8, 13 and 14. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. They might, that may not mean a lot to you right now, but for those who are listening, there may be some who have heard that verse quoted many, many times, especially the last verse. For 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And we will be studying that among other verses of Scripture today as we look at one more facet of the teachings of Adventism, the Adventist Church, that are out of sync with the scriptures, how they interpret that verse, and what effect it has upon our understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, I hope you will be blessed. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, this morning we are glad to be present in this place, glad to be together in your name. We're glad that we can be connected with so many who are not here but elsewhere and perhaps listening. Today as we study your word, I pray that the Spirit of God may come to this place, to be in this place, to meter out in kindness and gentleness words that will be spoken and texts that will be read that will give greater understanding to truth and to the gospel message. I pray that you will use this faulty instrument, O Lord. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
when I was young and a deacon at the University Church in Loma Linda, California, they had a pipe organ. And at the end of every service, the organist, there would be a song like this, a hymn like this, and the organist played just like that. And then he would go into a postlude that half the church would stay and just listen to as everyone else was leaving. It was just amazing. Can you imagine what it's going to be like in heaven? One hundred and seventy-eight years ago today, a group of Christians stood outside their homes, in their fields, on the streets of their towns, looking up into the skies, anxiously looking with anticipation for the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. William Miller, a Baptist preacher and a student of prophecy, had been preaching that Jesus would return on October 22, 1844, according to the prophecy that we read out of Daniel this morning. And there were many who had sold their possessions and joined this movement and believed that Jesus would be returning that day, according to the calculations of William Miller. Hiram Edson was one of those believers who spent October 22 with friends waiting for that event and was heartbroken when Jesus did not return. As the hours passed and Jesus didn't come, Edson reflected on the events of the previous year, all of the preaching and the studying and the anticipation that came, the excitement. The next morning, October 23, he and some friends went to visit some nearby Adventists, or Millerites, to encourage them. And he later wrote, We started out, and while passing through a large field, I was stopped about midway through the field. Heaven seemed open to my view. And I saw distinctly and clearly that instead of our high priest coming out of the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to come to this earth at the end of 2300 days, he for the first time entered on that day the second apartment of that sanctuary. And he had a work to perform in the most holy place before coming to the earth. Edson claimed to have received this insight from God and accordingly came to understand that the cleansing of the temple that we read about in Daniel 8, 14, meant that Jesus was moving from the holy place in the heavenly sanctuary to the most holy place and not to his second coming to the earth. To this day, this sad ending to a time of great anticipation where those who looked for the return of Christ is called the Great Disappointment. Seventh-day Adventists are a church that grew out of the Millerite movement, adopted Hiram Edson's understanding of Daniel 8.14, and includes that view as one of their tenets of faith today. It's interesting that Rachel Oaks, who was a Seventh-day Baptist, shortly after this great disappointment, introduced Adventists, Millerites, to the Seventh-day Sabbath. And 20 years later, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was established. It's appropriate today that we talk about this subject. It was not planned, but it's appropriate that today, the very day, October 22, that is recognized as that day, many years ago, when they expected Jesus to come, is a day that I actually have been led to address this subject, where those of my listeners 
who may have an Adventist background, who may be confused, and who are looking for better understanding. Perhaps they have seen some of the inconsistencies of that faith and are looking for an understanding not only of truth, but also a way to find a place where they can experience a clear teaching of the Word of God based upon the scriptures alone. It's also fitting that we would be talking about this subject October 22, but this, in nine days it's going to be October 31, and that's the 505th anniversary of the Reformation when the Reformers established five points of faith. Only the scriptures. The scriptures are our only authority for understanding faith and practicing the Christian faith. Jesus is the only means of salvation. He is the only one who can save us and has done so by grace alone, through faith alone, and only for his glory. And every time that we look at October 31 and the stores are promoting product to be purchased by people who will celebrate Halloween on October 31. I always think of October 31 as Reformation Day and a day to celebrate the truth that we have found in the Word of God alone and in Christ alone, through His grace alone and by faith alone. So let's go back to that text that we read before and let's look at what the Adventists teach and we'll end up reading this text again, I'm sure, before the, the morning is over. But let's look at this, this teaching. And this is actually taken from their statement of faith. There is a sanctuary in heaven. In it, Christ ministers on our behalf, making available to believers the benefits of his atoning sacrifice offered once for all on the cross. Sounds good. At his ascension, Christ was inaugurated as our great high priest, typified by the work of the high priest in the holy place of the earthly sanctuary. In 1844, at the end of the prophetic period of 2300 days, he entered the second and last phase of his atoning ministry which was typified by the work of the high priest in the most holy place of the earthly sanctuary. And in this ministry that began in 1844 by Christ, our high priest, in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, a work of investigative judgment began, which is part of the ultimate disposition of all sin. The investigative judgment reveals to heavenly intelligences those who among the dead are deemed worthy to be saved. It also makes manifest who among the living are abiding in Christ, keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And in him, therefore, are ready for translation into his everlasting kingdom. This judgment, the investigative judgment, which began in 1844 in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary by Christ our high priest, who moved from the holy place to the most holy place in 1844 to minister and to begin an investigative judgment. This judgment vindicates the justice of God in saving those who believe in Jesus. It declares that those who have remained loyal to God shall receive the kingdom. I don't know if there are any red flags that popped up as I was reading this. But in this teaching of the Adventist church is a major departure from scripture and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ as we have attempted to portray it these past four weeks. What are the implications of this? And I don't know. I mean, I know for someone who has heard this teaching all their lives, like I have, 
it says to us that there is still a judgment that we must face and we must pass. And what are the conditions of us passing that judgment? It is taught that this judgment, which began in 1844, began with those who profess to be followers of Christ who are now dead. And at some point along the way before Jesus comes, there will be a passing from the list of the dead to the list of the living. And you never know when your name is going to come up. And what are the requirements for passing through the investigative judgment? We must be sinless. Oh yes, it is through the power of the Holy Spirit that we become sinless, right? That is what's taught. It is through his power in our lives that we become sinless. But nevertheless, we must become sinless because there will come a time just before Jesus comes where he will leave the heavenly sanctuary. He will leave his intercession for us. And when he does, there will be no one to intercede for us and we will be on our own. Therefore, we must be worthy at that point to stand before God without an intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary. This teaching has engendered among Adventists doubt as to their standing before God, fear that their name may come up sometime in the near future and look at our lives today, right? Look at me, look at you. We are not perfect, we are not sinless. Therefore, there is fear as we face the judgment. And there is doubt as to our standing with God because we see our lives and how many times we have prayed that the Holy Spirit would change us into the likeness of Christ. And as he does that slowly, he does, he does, he changes who we are, he changes our hearts, the promises of scripture are that he would change our hearts and that he would begin to live out the life of Christ in us nevertheless. As we look at ourselves after how many years, you know, 76 for me. And how soon is Jesus coming? And when will my name come up in the judgment? There's no chance, there's no chance for me. This teaching denies the finished work of Christ on Calvary. It denies the gospel of Jesus Christ and it misrepresents the truth that brings us hope and freedom and light and peace and a sense of safety with Jesus Christ based upon all that he did for us long ago. His work was complete. When he hung on the cross and, and uttered those words, it is finished. My salvation was complete except for one thing. And that was for me to be born, to hear the word of truth, the gospel of my salvation, and place my faith in him. Yes. So we're going to look at what the Bible teaches about the heavenly sanctuary and the high priestly ministry of Christ to shed light upon the error of this teaching of this church. First, I want to look at this text again and tell you what this text actually means. It does not mean that Jesus, instead of coming to the earth to save the righteous, to take them to heaven, to cleanse the earth of all sin and the effects of sin, this text of scripture refers to a reign of terror by a king of the Seleucid, the Grecian Seleucid portion of the Greek, Greek Empire, begun by Alexander the Great. And as he died, that large horn, that large horn was broken and four other ones came up in its place. We, as these four horns rose, as it says in scripture, they came up in its place. They are the four generals of Alexander the Great, who divided up the kingdom of Greece into four parts, and each of them took a part of that kingdom. 
and one of them was the Seleucid Empire. And this verse refers to a, a horrible king by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, who rose up against the Jewish people. And for 2300 days, we don't have exact beginning date and exact ending date, this is, but this is the period during which he persecuted the Jews, slaughtered at least 80,000 of them, took possession of the temple and desecrated the sanctuary and offered pigs, place of a lamb, as a sacrifice to Zeus, the Greek god, whom he claimed to be the impersonation of. This reign of terror was prophesied as a type, as a type, in Daniel 8, 13, and 14, as a type of the final Antichrist who is to come at the end of time and persecute the saints for 1260 days, three and a half years. Antiochus Epiphanes lived between 215 and 164 BC, and his reign of terror was from about 171 BC to 164 BC, about six years and four months plus a little bit to represent the 2300 days that are spoken of in this prophecy. Hanukkah, which is a celebration of the Jews to this day, is a celebration of the cleansing of the temple, the restoration of the temple that he had de desecrated when they finally regained the power over their culture, over their nation, and reestablished worship to the God of heaven and restored the sanctuary to its rightful place in their worship. Hanukkah is the celebration of the Jews to this day over the cleansing of the temple that took place at the end of Antiochus Epiphanes' reign of terror. Yes. So, this has nothing to do with the high priestly ministry of Christ. It has nothing to do with that. So, this is, what is the purpose? What is the purpose of such teaching? Well, somebody saw the light from heaven, right? Somebody saw, I mean, how many people in, in history have seen something that they could swear was truly a message from God, but not necessarily. And yet the Adventist church received the stamp of Ellen White upon this teaching, and they have incorporated it in their statement of faith to this day. But it's not based on scripture not in scripture, and it denies the gospel. So what does the Bible teach about this entering of the most holy place by Jesus, our high priest? Let's look at some texts, the first of which is the first three verses of the book of Hebrews, which is all about Jesus. The book of Hebrews is all about Jesus being better than, better than angels, better than the creation of man, better than the sacrifice that was offered lambs and, and all of the blood of animals that was offered. It's better than the, the high priestly ministry of the old uh, Jewish model. And he brings with him a better covenant, the new covenant, based upon better promises. If you, if you read through the book of Hebrews, you just see better, 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 better all the way through. Jesus, it's all about him being better than all of that, which has been in the past. And so Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. What a 
glorious picture of Christ. It's just, it starts out with, with a display of glory. He says, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's the first verse of several that we're going to look at. But where would that possibly have been? If there's a sanctuary in heaven and the actual structure, if there is a structure, we'd, we don't really know for sure. But nevertheless, even if there is a structure in heaven, even if there is a temple in heaven, or like a throne, throne room where God sits, I mean, this imagery is certainly supported in Scripture. Where would that place of greatest honor, place of greatest privilege be? but in the most holy place at the right hand of the Father of heaven. That's where Jesus went. When he purged our sins, that's where he went. Right into the most holy place. Remember uh, when Mary met him at the tomb and she was so glad to see him and, and she's talking to Christ and he's talking to her and comforting her and then he says, do not detain me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Well, where did he go next? He went to his Father. He went to the very throne room of heaven. He went to, the, it's called, if there is a likeness in heaven to the earthly sanctuary, he went into the most holy place that Sunday morning when he had purged our sins. Well, the next text makes it clear in Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6, beginning with verse 18. In verse 18, it says, We have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. We, as believers in Christ, have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us in Christ. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever. What is this veil is talking about? Remember in the earthly temple at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, there was a veil that was rent from top to bottom by the hands of an angel to signify the end of the old system because now the Lamb of God had offered his life as the Passover Lamb, as the Savior of the world. And that veil separated, in the earthly temple, that veil separated the holy place from the most holy place, which is where in the old wilderness sanctuary, the, the Ark of the Covenant was, and the Shekinah glory was shown by the, the cherubim and the seraphim over the, over the mercy seat. And inside was the actual stones upon which Christ had written the Ten Commandments and gave them to Moses. And there, a couple other things was in there too, but that was that was where that was kept in the most holy place, the place where the high priest entered once a year on behalf of himself and Israel on the Day of Atonement. And it says here that we have this hope as an anchor of the soul which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever. In chapter 9, we have the earthly sanctuary spoken of by Paul. He says in verse 1, Indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary, the old covenant. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. 
And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, so he, 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 he sets up the imagery before us of what, what the old covenant and what the old system was under the old covenant, whereby man would bring his sins to the sanctuary and the blood of animals was offered, foreshadowing of that blood of Christ that would be offered. And so this is, this is Paul referencing the old, the old sanctuary, the old, uh, the old model. And in verse 6 it says, When these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself from the people's sins. And then verse 11. But Christ, but Christ. Remember I said in, in this whole book, there's angels are wonderful. They're ministering spirits, chapter 1. They're ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will be the recipients of salvation. And in chapter 2, God created mankind, but there was a better man who came. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is the better man. He is the one man who came to join our human family and to save us from sin. And then throughout this book, it's always comparing what was with what is in Jesus Christ. And in verse 11, he says, But Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered, what? The most holy place, once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And finally, in chapter 10, Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. What happened on Calvary? Let's go back to this idea of an investigative judgment for a moment. What happened on Calvary? that day when Jesus died. He passed through the judgment for you and me and was found guilty because of our sin and paid the price because of our sin. Yes, that was judgment day. Had he not been the life giver, he would have never come forth from that tomb. For he died the eternal death for us in order that we might not have to do so. And what did Jesus say before his death? He said, now is the judgment of this world. Now is the prince of this world cast down. In John chapter 5 and verse 24, he says, he who believes in my word has passed from death to life and shall not enter into judgment. And yet we have a judgment called the investigative judgment through which we must all pass and pass without sin in order to meet a savior who's coming and will not be able to finish, continue his intercession in heaven on our behalf because he is on his way from heaven to earth. Talk about the Catholic idea of purgatory. It's being refined in order to get to heaven, to be worthy of heaven. It's unscriptural, and it is against the teachings of the Word of God and the Gospel. There is a judgment ahead. The book of Revelation talks about this judgment. But it is a final judgment for the lost. But it will not be for those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, it says. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. Where is your name written? And one of the books that, was, that is opened for the final judgment or in the book of life, which has already passed through judgment. Your name has passed through judgment and has been written in the Lamb's book of life. 
Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Who are the dead, by the way, in this picture? The dead. Those are the ones who have come to life at the, at the return of Christ after the millennium. When Jesus comes back and there is that judgment day. Read the previous verses in chapter 20 of Revelation. It's when he has come back. And they are the ones who, who died at the brightness of his coming, of the sword of his mouth, which, with, which destroyed them as he came the second time. When he received his saints, they destroyed, he destroyed the wicked. And now it says that the, the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Why is this important? Vesta gave judgment. A place in time where one is being evaluated by God as to his worthiness to be finally saved. Are you kidding? If you are Christ, how are we saved? We're saved by grace through faith alone. As long as you are placing your faith in Jesus Christ, you are his and safe and have already entered in the judgment through his death on Calvary when he went through the judgment for us. He who believes in me has passed from death to life and shall not enter into judgment. John 5, 24. Don't forget it. Adventists, anyone who's confused about the investigative judgment, don't forget it. How good do we have to become? We have to be sinless, right? Through that time. That's in order to pass through the investigative judgment. And that time just before Jesus comes, where we live without a mediator. My goodness, that puts so much pressure on us, doesn't it? To be what we must be in order to be saved. When Jesus was for us all that needed to be for us, as us, in order that we might be saved. Because he was for us made to be sin, that we might be counted as righteous as himself and ready to meet Jesus in the, in the air. Or going, hearkening back to last Sabbath's message, or as John spoke of the gospel in Revelation 1.10 and 1910, the testimony of Jesus, wherever the gospel of Jesus is Christ, the testimony of Jesus Christ, the very essence, the very spirit of, the testimony of all scripture, Wherever the gospel of the scriptures is taught, spoken, believed, there you will find the divine force in the rudder of all biblical doctrine. From the gospel, the testimony of Jesus Christ flows the understanding of all else that pertains to mankind and his standing and relationship to God. A misunderstanding of, or a corruption, or a contamination of the gospel, which says, that it isn't just what he did for us, but it's what he's going to do in us as well. It's all together in one package. And that means that we need to keep looking at ourselves to see how well we're doing by his power to become a misunderstanding or a corruption of or a contamination of the gospel is the fountain from which all false doctrine flows. From Genesis to Revelation, the story of Christ and the riches of his grace toward the sinner are revealed the very reason why the dragon sought to destroy the Savior and corrupt his story. For to do so is to hold the sinner captive, not only to sin, but to doubt and fear of God's just judgment. So what does all this have to do with life at its best? Life at its best is a life living in the light of the truth of the scriptures and of the gospel. Light at its best is a life that is lived in a sense of freedom to be and to become all that we can be this side of heaven, but not fear that it's never enough because we have placed our faith in Jesus not only for what will get us to heaven, but what will prepare us for heaven. Paul said, and I repeat this text again, we can be confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in us will finish it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
We can count on that too. That he will finish what he needs to do in us to make us more prepared to live in heaven. I don't think the thief on the cross got a lot of preparation, to be honest with you. But he'll still be there. It isn't the preparation for heaven that gets us there. We have eternity to learn all of the things of God from his lips. So that's what life at its best has to be, has to do with this series of studies that we have done. This is the last of our five studies on this subject. And life at its best is a life lived with Christ, in Christ, and in the light of his word and truth and the gospel story of his salvation by grace through faith alone in him alone a reliance upon the scriptures alone that's where life as a christian is lived at its best and that is the point of this whole series so if you're a part of this new understanding of faith how are you to relate to that which you perhaps are still a part of in any church where the gospel is not properly taught, where there is not light and life and truth and the scriptures alone, where do you go from here? Well, a couple of observations. You may wish to continue to worship where you are currently worshiping with those that you love and know and have fellowship with and certainly that's a big part of worship and if there is no place where you can find fellowship close to you that teaches the word of God alone and trusts in the grace of Christ alone for salvation you may want to stay where you are but there are some things that go along with that it's kind of like for us for me going to church on Sunday I may go to church on Sunday and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ but it's on Sunday and it doesn't feel right it doesn't feel good it doesn't give me that full experience. You, it's, it, it may not. You may, if you continue where you are, knowing the things that you might know as a result of these studies and of your own study, you may, you may be like me, trying to go to church on Sunday and not hearing the truth of God's word completely. You always have to keep sifting the truth from the error. You know. So there's that, that liability, but it may be counterbalanced with the fellowship that you receive. And maybe God will use you as a light of truth in that environment, in that, that arena of darkness. Maybe God will give you an opportunity to shed the light of his word and truth and his gospel story upon those who are friends of yours. Or maybe you want to start a fellowship. I want you to know wherever you are, you are welcome here, and we as a church family will support you in any way we can to help you establish a cell of the church of Jesus Christ where you are and the fellowship that goes with it. I know that our church family stands behind that statement. So don't settle for less than the best. Don't settle for less than the best. Find life at its best with Jesus alone, based upon his word alone, and by receiving his grace alone, through faith alone, and all only for his glory. Can't take credit for anything when it's all said and done. It's all him. And I want you to know there's nothing like the truth of the gospel of Jesus to free the soul from the chains of sin and a bondage and fear and doubt and all of those things which many of us have experienced in our lives. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this morning once more I pray that the words that have been spoken today might ring true in the ears of my hearers and that you might create the light of heaven to shine upon the dark parts of their heart and their experience with you and bring life and light and truth and freedom and joy and blessing to their souls. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.